Revelation chapter 1. I'll begin by reading the entire chapter. <clears throat> the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Thank you, God, for this day. God, please, God, be with us and help us through this passage of Scripture. Lord, help us to see Jesus Christ revealed in the very pages. Amen. So as we read through this revelation of Jesus Christ, as you may tell, I'm beginning a series on the book of Revelation. Um, and, and the one thing that you will immediately recognize is if you have most Bibles at the top, it'll say the revelation of St. John the Divine. Well, the first thing that I do in most Bibles is I cross that out and give it the proper title, which is in verse 1. It was that easy. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yes, John penned it. He was the human instrument to record it and to distribute it and to give of the very words that are received here. But the revelation, the revealing of Jesus Christ is what we're talking about here in the context. I've sometimes referred to this as the fifth gospel because it continues on in the same vein as the gospels. Matthew saying this is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Mark saying the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Luke comes out and he says, A declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. And he sets these things forth in order unto his recipient 
In John it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And he begins to expound the story of Jesus Christ. And here, verse 1 begins and says, The revelation of Jesus Christ. A further, if you will, revealing of our Savior in the pages of Scriptures. And I like how it's phrased. I like how it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It doesn't mix words. It doesn't say, these are revelations as of many. These are many revelations of Christ. Rather, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is specific. This is pointed. This is a book that sets out from the very first four words to be a revealing of Christ. And this is going to be the goal and the purpose of it. It was given unto Jesus, and he gave it accordingly, is what it says. The revelation of Jesus Christ was God gave unto him for the purpose of to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he said and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So here, the purpose is to show servants which must things which must shortly come to pass. And at the time, they would have been 2,000 years off of where we're standing today. That doesn't seem so shortly. But as you read, you're going to find some of the things referred to are for a time then. Most are for a time afar off. And we don't consider it so, but 2,000 years with the Lord is but a moment of time. And if we were to find that Christ was to return within 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatsoever it is in God's time frame, those 2,000 years since this book was recorded at about 100 AD would be just a small flicker in human history. In fact, they would be about one-third of the totality of human history according to scriptures. Here this word, this very word to John is prepared and delivered in a very specific fashion. It was sent and signified by the angel unto the servant John. So God gave it unto Jesus. He sent it and signified it by his angel directly to his servant John. And this was how the word of God went forth in this particular instance. That word signified, some people will take that and they will break it down as it was signified. It was a sign that was then produced and then carried forth. In other words, everything you read here is going to be a sign. It's going to be symbology. It's going to be um, dark sayings, which are bold. And this is why the revelation becomes very daunting to certain people, because they'll read it as if it's all just a bunch of allegories and, and, and metaphors and similes, and it's all just there to paint some sort of prophetic picture that we can't really understand. But no, signified in and of itself means, I believe, how the scripture puts it. Keep your finger there and you can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 to find another instance where that same word or a, a form of that word was used. Signified. Sentence signified. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now the word signified, it means conveyed. It means transferred. It means to put forth meaning. Another way you can put it is that it was given significance. He sent and gave significance to the Word of God. And here you'll find in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, beginning in verse 9, how signified is used quite often in scriptures. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 9. So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken for ye shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, Seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Here the context of signification, the voices, the many voices in the world, each of them having specific signification, points to the key phrases within the context. What are those? Easy to be understood, knowing the meaning, excelling to the edifying. And so then signified or signification appropriated to words that are spoken talks of them being easily understood, given meaning, giving clarity. 
excelling to the edification of the church, or as it says before in verse 8, if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So a word with signification is a trumpet that has a certain sound. You know the trumpet sound, and therefore you prepare yourself unto the battle. So sending the word unto the angel who sent it unto John is actually sending the word to the angel, giving it a conveyed and transferred appropriate message, significance giving to it, making it easy to be understood, making it endure and excel to the edification of the church, and giving it meaning that particularly applies to the context of the people that it's referring to. It gives a conveyed certain sound. And that's exactly what's happening here. The revelation of Jesus Christ wasn't sent to be a mixed up sign of a post-apocalyptic vision of people that is very confusing like the world offers, you know, Nostradamus or, or any of these others that have these fanciful illusions of what the end times will be like. No, the revelation of Jesus Christ was sent and signified. It was sent to convey meaning. It was sent to be easily understood specifically to the church with a certain sound, with a proper sound that a trumpet would make. Therefore, those that hear it would prepare themselves unto the battle. Here, his angel or his messenger, I don't necessarily believe here in the context, is specifically the Holy Spirit of God. We know the ministry of the Spirit of God is to bring the things which Christ taught into our remembrance. So certainly he would have played a role in drawing from things that John had previously learned or wrote or drawn from things that he had previously read or been taught. Certainly he would pray play this role, but as we see and will see as we read through this, God has many angels at his disposal and they all serve as messengers to get his word to the proper recipient. So here I think it's likely another angel other than the Holy Ghost bringing the message specifically unto John, bringing him the message that needs to be conveyed, the message that needs to be properly transferred, give meaning, give a certain sound, that people could behold it, people could understand it. Christians here today should be able to understand the book of Revelation. That It's not a concealing of Jesus Christ, it is a very revelation of Jesus Christ, showing unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And here John, the beloved, is the specific vessel who is chosen to receive from the angel the message that was given unto the angel. And that he becomes then the vessel that brings that same message forward to the servants, which is us, where we stand today. John here, the beloved, we know was one that penned the gospel of John. We know he was one that penned first, second, and third epistle of John. We know him as the one that sat upon Jesus' breast. We know that he followed him right unto the very end, for he was in with the high priest in as much as he was allowed access to the very room where Jesus was condemned and the very uh, process by which he was uh, tried and whipped and scourged and eventually put upon a cross. John was there as the beloved to see all these things. He was very close then to Jesus' breast, Jesus' heart. He never strayed too far from him. So what better man then to reveal Christ in his fullness at such a time as this? When all of the apostles have long since died away and all of their voices have no more signification, there is no more utterance coming from these men. John, to silence his voice, was cast into an island called Patmos where he would live out the rest of his days. And yet God still used him to be that certain sound, to round out the fullness of the revelation of God which he was given by the angel and often and, and repeatedly was faithful to do so. He was faithful in this act. We know that in the gospel he preached and wrote that men might be saved. To the end, John was written that men would be saved. The epistles then that he learned as we studied were used that saved men might grow up in the things of God, that they would act out the eternal life that God had placed in them. And now here, Revelation gives the fullness of the understanding, the fullness of the story when he proclaims by pen that the wicked would be judged and that the saved 
would be strengthened in these last days, in the short time that is to come, and they would be redeemed from this earth, and they would be glorified. And John, in all three aspects of his ministry, whether it be the gospel, the, uh, the epistles, or whether it be calling down the judgment and preaching and writing of the judgment recorded in Revelation, he was faithful to do such. Verse 2, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and all things which he saw. This is the, this is the final testimony of John here at this time. He bare record of the word and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and all the things which he saw. Three things that he did very affluently that we too as believers ought to endeavor to do. Bear the word of God. Don't doubt it. Bring it with you. Carry it. Mark these scriptures, memorize them, commit them to heart, bear them with you wherever you go. Even the testimony of Jesus Christ. Bring that, the story, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says of the testimony of Jesus Christ that that is the very spirit of prophecy. So preaching, the spirit of preaching, comes from the testimony of Jesus Christ. That is the root and foundation of it. The formal then testimony, the formal written statement or the evidence or the proof or the witness, the testimony of Jesus Christ, John was faithful to bring it with him. He bare record of it, the word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ, and also this, all things that he saw. So here this would be John's own words, John's own testimony, John's own scenes, John's own feelings. John's own desire, all of the feelings of John, all the things that he saw, all the things that he absorbed and observed as he went through these situations, he also brought with them. We ought to bring the same each and everywhere we go. The word of God, the testimony, the preaching, the prophecy of Jesus Christ, and our own testimony and experience to give power unto it. And this is the offensive weapon and power that any Christian has in bearing of these three things and also bringing and transmitting these very things. Our testimony gives great power unto the testimony of Jesus Christ and his gospel unto the word of God which gives power unto it and rounds it all out. This is our offensive weapon and it's this offensive weapon by which nobody can stand against. This is the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. This is the sword of the Lord and of Josh. This here is describing the sword of the Lord and of John the Apostle. He brought the word. He brought the testimony of Christ and the things that he had sown as his own personal testimony and he is transmitting these. Verse 3 says, Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. And so blessing comes upon, and this is one of the few cases you'll find in scriptures where a specific blessing is allotted to the one that would read, the one that would receive, and the one that would retain the words contained within the scripture. He says it clearly, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. He wants you then to receive that blessing. Doesn't everybody in here want to receive a blessing? Well, here is one way contained within the scriptures that we can be blessed of God. Read his word. Look to and discover the things that are contained therein, the text. Here, retain that same word that you are reading. Intake it, receive it, eat it. Take that and hear it, hearken unto it. And keeping implies you are applying it. You are guarding it, retaining it, and doing something with the word that is preached. Read the word, receive the word, retain the word, and be blessed in and of the same. Specifically here, the revelation of Jesus Christ is where you can have God's promise. And you can remind him of that every time you open that book. God, you promised I will be blessed by reading, by hearing, by keeping those things. Help me to do these. Read them. Hear them. Do them. Keep them. Apply them to your life. And be blessed in the same. And our purpose ought to be to receive of that same blessing. It's there for us. It's just waiting for us. It seems simple. Hear, read, keep. Read, hear, keep. Read, hear, keep. Promise of blessing comes. And it says this, for the time is at hand. Because the time is at hand. That long time that we thought... You know, it is so far off and it is so far away from the, the standpoint in which we are at right now. 
is referred to in the scriptures as at hand. The time is at hand. The time is before you. The time is looming. The time is now. And the reality is, is yes, that's the same for all of us. We only have a measured amount of time on this earth whereby we can receive the blessing that's being promised here. But what he's describing is the last days people that as a whole have a time that is at hand, that is ready to be implemented, that it is coming upon them. And now is the time, more so than even then before, where we need to be receiving the blessing of God by reading, hearing, and keeping. The time is at hand, right? The time is now. The time is, is, is to the revelator here, John, just in right there, just at hand, just before him. How much more so to us 2,000 years later? We need to understand then the purpose here is to show that Jesus will shortly come. The things that are being revealed here will shortly come to pass. What's being prepared here is that the book, the writing, the scriptures were sent and signified unto John. And who did they initially go to? Well, the Bible records they went unto seven churches in Asia. Verse 4, it begins, John to the seven churches. Everything previous to this was an introduction, talking about the book itself, the revelation, that you're blessed in receiving it, that this is a faithful record of the word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ, and all the things which he saw. He is saying that these very words are the word of God. This is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This can be, like, stamp it, set it to mark. This is the very word of God, and he begins to address his letter as this in verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you in peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before the throne. Now, first of all, I want to talk about these churches, these seven churches which are in Asia. Some will take them and they'll break it up as if there's some sort of time periods, but I believe seven churches that he is writing to were not a church in this hundred years of history, and then a church in this 500 years of history, and then it's some sort of timeline between John and us. It wouldn't have made sense because why would God have him literally pen these words to the churches? Although churches throughout those spans of time have read those things, we can look at certain of them and recognize that those churches don't exist today to even receive of that blessing. Asia does not have all of these churches scattered amongst its landscape. No, he is writing to specific churches at the specific time in which he is living, in which he is referring. These churches then would receive of the exact revelation of Jesus Christ as we are reading it today. I believe that by faith. I don't have the original manuscript, but I don't need it. I need to trust by faith that the word is God with God and all of those things that are contained within are Christ and they're just as perfect as he is. So here we hold the same letter that was posted unto these real churches in John's day. That being said, we can read and apply these characteristics as they are applicable unto the church in the same way as if they were penned to us. And so could people throughout history. It's the same way as when we open Romans and we open Corinthians and we take what's being taught in those books. Though we aren't the Roman church and we aren't the Corinthian church, we take the truths and the applications and the different things that are being said and we apply them directly to the church here. Sound words. We can take also in the same way Philemon and Timothy, though they were penned to specific men that lived in a specific time and a specific day far, far, far and long ago, we can take the truths that are being explained unto them and apply them to ourselves. Well, why can we do this? Because the Bible was meant to transcend time. It is historical in context, but it's also applicable in where we're living. We need to take the word of God as if it's being recorded, penned just moments ago and written directly towards us. Because that's how God wants to communicate with us. He's not, he's not shouting down through history and hoping that we understand the context in which John was living and know exactly what was going on in Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos and Thyatira and all these churches and then apply it only to them and leave it there. No, we can take these different truths and bring them into our realm and use them to encourage and strengthen strengthen us. Same way with the words that are penned to specific men. We can take them, draw them into the context that we're living in because it's a li living word and we can use them to apply and to help us at this time. 
He begins in this salutation then by saying grace to you and peace. And it's a very common, um, uh, a very common address that he would give to people. Grace to you and peace. Grace to you and peace. We saw the Apostle Paul did that quite often the same way. Grace to you and peace. Ministering of the same to them. And he says from what I believe here, the hymn, which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before the throne, to be Jesus Christ. Him which is, him which was, and him which is to come. And he affirms it in verse 8. I'm Alpha and the Omega, beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Right? And he's constantly referring in that same way uh, to himself in that same fashion. And we recognize Christ in that, though some could probably take that same scripture and apply it to the Father. Um, it doesn't shock me and alarm me when their characteristics kind of overlap because these three are one. We need to understand that they're, of course, they are different, but they are the same. They have a oneness. They also have a tryness. They are very different. They are very the same, but they would all exhibit perhaps the same characteristics. Here, I believe it's referring directly to Jesus, though I can also see how it might be referring to the Father in verse 4 and Jesus Christ in verse 5, because it specifically makes that differentiation where it says, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. Sometimes in Bible language, it will say, and from, and refer to the same context of which it was already talking. And that's the position that I'm going to take, though I might change that tomorrow. I don't think there would be any fault in that, because, because God is God, is God, is God, is God. And he's the one giving the revelation of himself, the express personage that we would behold, which would be Jesus Christ. In the end, it would all come full circle, and the understanding is that God is the one which is, which was, and which is to come. In the context of scriptures here, what is he talking about? He's talking about which is. In other words, he is presently the one. He is presently uh, alive, well, doing. He is. He is present. He is. But then it says this, and which was. So he, he is, but then also in past he was. He, 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 is, he is being differentiated, and also it says he is to come. This is just a, a, a crazy mixed up way of expressing to us that he's just everywhere. He's just all times. He's just omnipresent, if you will. And it's just another characteristic of God. How can, how, he is and he was. Well, was gives the connotation that he isn't anymore. But the Bible says he is. But he's also coming. But if he was, then why would he come if he already is? <laughs> Do you see how you can just kind of get mixed up in the whole thinking of the thing? Basically, the expression is here is that God is in all realms of time as we are trying to grasp it in our own understanding. He is transcendent of time then. And the same is applied to the very throne that he sits upon. It says, him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. His throne then having the same application is that it is one that is, it is one that was, and it is one that is to come. It is transcendent of the time that we currently live in God is still on the throne. We can say that just as surely as the Apostle John could 2,000 years ago as we can say it now. And somebody in the days of Noah could say God is still on the throne. He was on the throne. He is on the throne. And he will come on that very throne that he is currently abiding on. So as you read through this, again, you'll see that transcendent declaration of Christ and again, while some people may understand it a little bit different of who it's applying to, ultimately it is God who's being expressed here as the one which is and which was and which is to come. Verse 5 says, and from Jesus Christ. Again, giving a little bit more specificness. Now I don't have to wonder and guess about who the him is. Now it's specifically Jesus Christ. And it's going to give him three attributes. It says, Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, and, and, and then leave it there. So Jesus here then is described as the faithful witness. In John chapter 5, and you can turn to John chapter 8 if you'd like. In John chapter 5, you would find Jesus making the statement, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. He made that statement in John chapter 5. He said, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. And that is a true fact. If I am witnessing of myself and there was no one else to witness it, my witness would not be deemed true in any type of 
judgment or a court of law or subject of scrutiny. John chapter 5, he says, if I bear witness of myself, that witness is not true. Then you'll find in John chapter 8, and remember this is all we're talking about Jesus Christ as the faithful witness. But he made that statement that he's bearing witness of himself, yet it's not true. John chapter 8, the Pharisees tried to use Jesus Christ's own words against him. And aren't they, aren't they just so familiar with doing this type of tactic? In John chapter 8 and verse 12, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, so he made a great statement that he is the light of the world. And they would have been familiar with Genesis that said there's two lights that were created. The greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the earth. Jesus is saying, I am that light. I am the light of life. If a man followeth me, he shall not walk in darkness. Great bold statements that Christ is making. The Pharisees said unto him in verse 13, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Jesus made that same statement. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. And so they said, ha, we caught him. He's tripped up in his own preaching as they oft tried to do. But verse 14, he brings into their remembrance a few different nuances of it. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I come or whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. Jesus is highlighting the fact that that he is not in a position to judge what they know. He knows in of himself where he came from and where he is going. In other words, he is all knowing of the present situation, including of those that stand before him. And he's saying, you're judging after the flesh. I judge no man. You guys have the wrong sight. You have the wrong vision. He was constantly trying to tell these guys. Remember Nicodemus in John chapter 3, who was thinking of the flesh. How can I enter the second time in my mother's womb and be born? Ye judge after the flesh, Nicodemus, in the same way ye Pharisees judge after the flesh. And he continues in verse 16, and he says, And yet, if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. Making this statement that he is not alone, but now I and the Father that sent me are united here. They are united in the same judgment. Therefore, my judgment is just and true because it's the same judgment of the one that is with me. I am not alone in this. And he brings back their own words of the testimony unto them when he says, It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that beareth witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. They said unto him, Where is thy Father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor the Father. If ye had known me, ye should have known the Father also. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour is not yet come. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself, because he cannot, because he saith, Whether I go, ye cannot come. And he saith unto them, and here's more statements, and they asked to see the Father. Jesus said, You don't know him, and that's the problem. You are fleshly minded. You're judging after the flesh. I am here making the judgment. I am here in testimony of myself. The Father is bearing witness of the testimony. If you knew him, you'd know me. And then he continues on in the same vein after he said the statement, I am the light of the world, and whither I go, you cannot know. Why? Because they haven't believed on him. That's why they're not going to the same place where he's going. He continues to just twist the knife, twist the sword into them, as he says in verse 23. And he saith unto them, Ye are from beneath. I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? Jesus said unto him, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. Here in three authoritative statements of his own Godliness, he proclaims, I am from above, not of this world. I am he. That statement that was made in the Old Testament scripture when it was asked, What is your name? I am that I am. I am he. Who are you? He that is from the beginning. He keeps pointing back to the fact that Jesus Christ, I am God. I am God, Jesus is saying, and expressing that the Father bears witness to it, not only through the scriptures, but in the very declaration that thundered from the heavens, Thou art my beloved Son whom I am well pleased when he was baptized. Here, 
Jesus proves himself as the faithful witness. Why? Because he has the authority of the word of God supporting his every move as he walks here upon the earth. So even so, as we read this, you can understand perhaps a little bit of their confusion as they're facing a man. And I believe it's possible for us to even get tripped up in some of these, what would I call like abovely truths, some of these greater truths of the scriptures. And these are ones where when you behold them perhaps the first time or the second time, they don't really shed a lot of light onto you, especially if you're a first time reader through the book of John, these might go right over your head. But what we need to do as Christians is not get caught up in the carnal thinking that the first didn't judge after the flesh, but we need to trust and have faithfulness upon Christ who is the faithful witness. When Jesus says, I am the faithful witness, we need to say, you are the faithful witness and just believe it and accept it and trust it even as it's presented. He also says here, if you go back to Revelation chapter 1, he says, I am the faithful witness, Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness. In verse, uh, the second part of that verse, he says, and the first begotten of the dead. And the first begotten of the dead. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about the idea of Christ being the first begotten of the dead. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, known as the great resurrection chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in verse 16 will highlight Christ as the first begotten of the dead. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 16. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain and you are yet in your sins. You see how this is a faith position? We need to trust in what happened because it's being presented to us in a way that is to the carnal mind very difficult to understand. That Christ 2,000 years ago rose from the dead in order that we could be relieved, absolved, freed from our sins. Verse 18 says, Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. And I love this phrase because it brings a sobriety to the whole of our faith. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, if our only hope in this life is the hope that is offered of Christ. In other words, we can live a good life. In other words, we can do Christ-like things. In other words, we can help people. We can grow people. We can feed the poor. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, if this is it, we are of all men most miserable. There is misery to it because we go through so much as Christians. These apostles went through so much as believers. And therefore, if it was all in vain, if they had no faith to put on Christ if they did not believe and trust in the God that is the faithful witness, that is the first begotten of dead. Of all men, they are most miserable. Why? Because all of this has been in vain to the end of nothing, to the end of whatsoever the world has to offer. But now, verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. I love this. He says, hey, if we have only hope in this life of Christ, then we're miserable, but now is Christ risen from the dead. And he makes that great faith position, that great faith statement, regardless of what you think, but now is Christ risen from the dead. Present tense, he is risen, he is risen, he is risen, he arose, and he still remains there. He's become the first fruits of them that slept, and as the first fruit, what can we count on? A second fruit, a third fruit, a fourth fruit, a one million fruit. However many would believe can take part in that same resurrection that Christ has. Verse 21, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For it is as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own time, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall be delivered up, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under the feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Here he is highlighting the fact that the resurrection of the dead is to the end that the dead will die no more if they're in Christ. He is saying that the end of Christ being the first fruits is that death will no more have dominion. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. This is the blessed hope. This is the glorious appearing. This is the truth that is contained in the scriptures about the resurrection, the first 
resurrection of Christ. And when we are alive, or if we are there, when he comes at his second thing, we will be raised up in that same way at his coming. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming, and then there is another resurrection. But that last enemy, after that time when Christ reigned, that shall be destroyed, is death. So here, this scripture is giving testimony to the fact that Christ is what he said. He is the faithful witness, and should we doubt even at all when he says he is the first begotten of the dead? No, we shouldn't. We should just believe that by faith. But it's great when we have the scriptures there to affirm it. Verse 27 says, For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And what that's talking about here is that Christ will reign for a time until the resurrections are complete, and then he will present it to the Father that put all things under Christ. And at that time shall all things be all in all. God may be above all things, everything placed in subjection unto him. Things will be appropriate, things will be right, and things will be finalized within the world, and all will be well. The next thing that you'll see is that Christ is the Prince of the kings of the earth. Back in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, the first begotten, the prince of the kings. In other words, he is the king of kings. He is above them. And that's what it even said in that statement about how Christ hath all things under him, even though all aren't in subjection unto him. But when that time comes, all of the princes of the kings of the earth will be placed under him, and Christ will be all in all, God above all, and he will finally reign as it is appropriate. And so we see then in verse 5, Christ as the faithful witness. We see then Christ as the first begotten of the dead. We see then Christ as the prince of the kings of the earth. As high and lofted and lifted up as he is. What a wonderful image we see that the God that it is high as he ought to be and as he is in this earth loved us. And this is the great message that you see in the book of Revelation is that even as God deserves to be up and above and high and lofty, he loved so much that he could reach down and pluck up us to join him in such a resurrection. Why? Because he first loved us. Verse 5 says, Faithful witness, first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Here God presents the idea that while he is above all, he is transcendent of time, is, was, and is to come. While he is the faithful witness, first begotten of the dead, prince of the kings of the earth, lifting himself up as beyond reachable, beyond what any man could surpass or live or be, he still in that state loved us. The Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says that he commandeth or proved his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. The Bible also records that it wasn't just for us who have believed, as the Calvinists teach, but it's for all men. It records in Timothy, he is the savior of all men, but this, especially of they that believe. Christ gave in love, proving his love toward all, dying for all, in that great act upon the cross of Calvary, to the end that especially those that believe would receive of that same love. He loved us. But look at this. He washed us from our sins in his own blood. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18 says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And it's amazing to me how whiteness comes from Christ through his blood. How can whiteness come through blood? Well, it's just another great and wonderful miracle that he has. He's describing in Isaiah that though your sins are red as crimson, they shall be white as snow. Though they be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. And it's in his blood, his own blood, that anyone is washed from their own sins. The statement is made 
affirming Christ's love that he shed his own blood in order that our sins might be washed away. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says, Without the shedding of blood there is no remission. And it says also that all things by the law are purged by blood. In other words, every condemnation that comes upon us under the law of sin and of death is purged by the shedding of blood. Not the, not the bulls and goats that were yearly brought or weekly brought or what, in whatever, because it was impossible that they could take away sins, though they absolve perhaps for a time and forgiveness is given. But the shed blood of Christ was the finality of it all. The forgiveness of sins and through faith in his shed blood and his sacrifice, we can be atoned. Leviticus 17, 11, It is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. Why? Because the very life is in the blood. That's why the Bible described as not drinking the blood. They, they had blood in a special position of reverence in the Old Testament. And the purpose was to lift it up and to show that it is where the life is. And what did Christ say back in John? He said, he is the light of the world. He is the life of all men. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. And so by his blood, the Bible says, his love is shown in that he washed us from his sins in that same blood. But I love this also. God didn't, again, just leave us there because he makes statements here where he is basically bringing us alongside of his great redemption. And because we are in Christ, we are made partakers of the same position that Christ now has. Verse 6 says, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Remember, all things have been placed under Christ, though we don't see it in this realm yet. But there's going to come a time when Christ will offer up all things unto the Father, then we'll all be in all, and we will all be beneath the Father, as one in the Bible describes that Christ will reign with us, and he hath made us kings and priests unto God the Father. So we have the same position that was never to be held by one man. You could not be in the New Testament a king and also a priest. We know that Saul made a great fall in his life because he had not waited for the priest, for the preacher to come to offer the sacrifice, but as a king did it of himself. And that was the beginning of the end of him. No, king and priest were to be different ministries, but here God makes us kings and priests unto the Father, unto God, and though he has dominion and glory forever and ever as it ought to be, I love seeing that his atonement sheds, gets rid of our sins, washes us white as snow, and brings us on board with the ministry that we have. We should be mud, we should be dead, we should be bloodied ourselves, buried in the lowest hells because of the lie that we have told. And yet God sees it good to, through Christ, show his love toward us, washing us in his own begotten son's blood, making us to reign and to rule with him on high, though glory and dominion be unto him forever and ever. And all I can say to a statement like that is amen. What a wonderful gift that God would reveal to us his son that we would have the word of God here. We would have the testimony. We could be blessed by reading it, by hearing it, by keeping the same things that are written therein. And what's written there is, is a great story of redemption. That I as a pauper, that I as someone lower, just scum of the earth between God's toenails, could be lifted up and cleansed and made a king and priest in his very, name, his very courts. What a wonderful gift that God has given us, making us partakers of the resurrection as the second fruits, third fruits, fourth fruits, a part of that great harvest, Christ as the first, and then eventually Christ will send it all before the Father, and he will rest and abide with us, and us in Christ will have the same ministry, we're partakers of the same heavenly calling and he is, as he is. I don't know how it's all going to work, but I like how it sounds. I like how God has laid before us the revealing of himself, and it seems to bring us who believe by faith on par with him. Though I can't help but think, I'll still be giving him glory. I'll still be giving him dominion. I'll still be giving him praise. Yet what a glorious message. What a glorious redemption story that he sets forth as he brings us all to be a part of him and his heavenly calling, his heavenly glory, that we could be seated 
at the right hand of the Father. Even. Be with Christ. Be in Christ. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. My perfect man is sitting there at the right hand of the Father. How much more when we are shedding this flesh, when we have a resurrected, redemptive body, when we rise again and are resurrected with him in glory, we have the same glorious body, we shed corruptible, put on incorruption, and stand before him in heaven. What a glorious, glorious day that is going to be. And I'm going to say unto him, be glory and dominion forever and ever. God will always be over us. His Father will always be over us. And all we can say is amen. Even so, amen. It's a glorious story. And I, I love to hear it and I love to see it. And, and as we read this, we're going to see that there's blessings that read. And when we hear, when we keep those things. And so I don't intend to rush through this. I don't intend to be 22 weeks and we'll be through this. I just went through six verses, and I could go and go and go and go. There's so much here. But would to God he would just give us a little bit more of a revealing of who he is, and we can understand the truth of who he is, and know what he wants for us. This is what the Bible records. We are blessed by reading, hearing, and keeping those things that are written. That The time is at hand. It's time to get to it. It's time to get to work. It's time to get these things into our heart, into our minds, into our being. It's time. The time is at hand. 2,000 years ago, the time was at hand. We've been talking about, you know, getting, getting more into things, having better time management. Well, the time is at hand. There is no more time. We're out of time, right? It's here. It's now. Now is the day that we need to get these things into us. Now is the day that we need Christ to reveal himself unto us, that we may grow thereby and grow unto him and see his glory. Thank you, Father, for your word. I pray, God, that you would... Just bless us in, in reading this. Lord, help us to go through this as Bereans. Lord, help us to search the scriptures and to find out whether these things be so and to, to each get our own our own, our own take and understanding of these things because I, I know that this is a living word and I know that you'll take it and you'll apply it to my heart differently than you'll apply it to someone else's heart. There's an overarching truth. I understand that there's going to be one testimony that the Spirit of God gives us, but we all need to have Christ reveal himself to each one of us personally. And I pray God through this study that he will do so and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. Handbook. If you can find it for me, just shout it out. Two hundred and thirty eight. God, you got it. Two thirty eight. Good one. 238, let's stand and sing together. Christ liveth in me. 238. 238. Christ liveth in me. Once far from God and dead in sin, no light my heart could see. But in God's word, the
that Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. Oh, what a salvation this that Christ liveth in me. That verse four there, it's um, you know, that longing in my heart is filled that like him I may be. So this guy isn't fully full of Christ here, but there's a longing in his heart. There's a desire in his heart. He wants that he could be filled with Christ there. And on the wondrous thought I dwell. So, so it's, it's beyond him. It's a wondrous thought. He's thinking. He's meditating upon. It, it seems so far beyond what he could even imagine. But he's dwelling on this thought. And this is meditation. This is, this is meditating upon the scriptures. What the Bible constantly refers that we should do. And the Bible says that when Joshua meditated upon the word, that's when he had great success. That's when he was prosperous, right? As on the wondrous thought I dwell... That Christ liveth in me. I think too many of us don't understand that. We don't really take and appreciate and render those things to be true. Christ actually lives in you. Christ resides in you. If you're a born-again, blood-bought Christian today, Christ has given you all things which pertain unto life and godliness within you. What we need to do, I think, is what this guy did. He, he with longing in his heart, with a desire, with a will to, with a want to, meditated with that same full heart on that wondrous thought, dwelling on that thought, thinking about that thought. Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. Christ liveth in me. What a salvation that Christ liveth in me. We're not just saved from hell. Yeah, that's great. But, but we're saved from a life. We're saved from Christ living in us, giving us power, giving us that everlasting life to do great things with it. And not just things in this earth, not just feeding people, not just helping people across the road, not just giving people shelter, but actually making a difference. And giving what we have power to do is give that same salvation unto others. Amen. Let's sing that chorus again. Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. Think about that. Oh, what a salvation this that Christ liveth in me. Render those things to be true. Believe it. Trust it. Faith. Faith is still the walk that we have today. Thank you. Praise God. I thank you, God, for your goodness and for your love. Lord, Lord, go with us today. Help us to really understand the truth. Be, have you reveal yourself to us afresh and anew that we could do according to your wills because we've had a, a, a very real experience with the living God who reached down in love and brought us up to him, that we could live in him and he in us and have that same abiding consequence whereby we live the life, the everlasting life today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.